السلام عليكم ورحمة الله يا رب تكونوا بخير عاملين ايه طمنونا عليكم معلش انا اتأخرت عنكم كتير قوي بس كان عندي امتحانات كده والحمد لله يعني عدت على خير وعايز ارجع معاكم كده نتكلم شوية في النيوماتيك سيستم ده فيديو حلو قوي في النيوماتيك اللي هي منظومات الهواء مفيد طبعا ومهم لأي مهندس جديد لأي فن موجود في مصنع لأي حد حابب المجال بتاع النيوماتيك احنا كل كلامنا عن الزيت عايزين نتكلم شوية عن النيوماتيك انا كل اللي عملته في الفيديو ده ان انا ترجمته فانا عايزك تشوفه تمام هتلاقي بيشرح حاجات حلوة قوي ومهمة جدا في المجال الصناعي الخاص بالنيوماتيك سيستم طبعا كل المجالات دلوقتي فيها نيوماتيك وهيدروليك فاحنا تطرقنا كتير قوي للهيدروليك وعايزين نرجع شوية للنيوماتيك لو انت بعد الفيديو ده حابب ان انا اشرح في النيوماتيك اوكي حابب ان الموضوع ممكن انزلكوا شوية فيديوهات كده مترجمين برضو يعني اتس اوكي معاكم في اي حاجة ولكن عشان انا اتأخرت عليكم قوي قلت اما انزل لكم حاجة كده ريفرش تتفرجوا عليها مهم جدا برضو للطلبة اللي في الكليات وفي المعاهد يشوفوا الصناعة عاملة ازاي في النيوماتيك سيستم هسيبكم مع الفيديو وان شاء الله باذن الله اشوفكم الفيديو الجاي على خير قريب جدا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Industrial pneumatics is a cornerstone of automation, but mastering the concepts can be challenging. In this video, we'll simplify the key elements of industrial pneumatic systems. We'll guide you through air preparation, regulators, actuators, and valves, breaking down each part step by step. By the end, you'll have the knowledge to read and interpret pneumatic schematics and understand system components. So, let's get started. First, let's talk about linear actuators. Linear actuators, or air cylinders, convert compressed air into extend and retract motion. Common applications include material handling, like transferring parts, and clamping systems for holding objects securely. Air cylinders come in several types, each designed for specific tasks. Here are the most common ones and what they're used for. 1. Single acting cylinders. These cylinders operate by using compressed air to move the piston in one direction while a spring returns it to its starting position. They're ideal for straightforward, one-way motion, like lifting or pushing in simple applications. 2. Double-acting cylinders. Double-acting cylinders use compressed air to move the piston in both directions, extending and retracting. They're perfect for tasks that require continuous back-and-forth motion, such as performing repetitive push-pull actions. 3. Double-acting magnetic cylinders. These cylinders have a magnetic piston inside a non-magnetic aluminum body, allowing for bidirectional motion powered by compressed air. Many of them are equipped with magnetically operated reed switches that can detect the piston's position, making them ideal for applications where precise positioning is important, such as in automation systems. 4. Rodless Magnetic Cylinders These cylinders rely on a magnetic coupling to move a carriage along the cylinder's body. Because they don't have a traditional piston rod, they're compact and a great choice for spaces where a standard cylinder wouldn't fit. 5. Rodless Cable Rodless cable cylinders use a cable mechanism instead of a traditional piston rod. The cable transfers motion as it moves back and forth with the piston. These cylinders are an excellent choice for long-stroke applications where a compact and space-saving design is required. They are commonly used in material handling systems, and other linear motion applications. Next, let's talk about flow control valves. These valves are used to adjust the flow of the compressed air, which in turn changes the speed of the actuator. In our system, we're using a directional flow control valve. This means it only controls the flow in one direction. There's a check valve on the outlet side that makes sure the flow goes through an adjustable opening, or orifice. A good rule of thumb is to use the flow control to regulate the flow as it exits which is called meter out. This method generally provides smoother operation than controlling the flow when it enters. Let's dive into directional valves. They might seem a bit complicated at first, but don't worry, 
We'll break them down step by step to make everything clear. To explain how a directional valve works, we'll focus on the one featured in our schematic, a four-way, five-port, solenoid-operated, spring return valve. But before we dive in, we'd like to ask for a small favor. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel. And while you're at it, don't forget to hit the notification bell so you never miss an update, and give this video a thumbs up if you find it helpful. Your support really helps us grow, and keeps us motivated to bring you more valuable content. So how does a pneumatic valve actually work? A pneumatic directional valve is made up of three main components, the body, the ports, and the spool. First, the valve body is the main structure that houses all the internal components. It's designed with precision to allow the spool to route compressed air to the appropriate port while directing exhaust to its designated outlet. The term four-way refers to the four distinct flow paths that the valve can create. These paths allow the valve to direct air to different components in a pneumatic system. Typically, a four-way valve is used to control a double-acting actuator or cylinder, which requires two separate airflow paths, one path to extend the cylinder another path to retract the cylinder. The other two flow paths are for the exhaust of air from rod end or blind end of the cylinder. It's called a five-port valve because, in addition to the main air supply and two output ports, it has two dedicated exhaust ports. In our example, we're looking at a solenoid-operated spring return valve. This type of valve uses a solenoid to shift the spool when energized and relies on a spring to return the spool to its default position when the solenoid is de-energized. If you examine the valve symbol, you'll notice the spring is shown on the right side. This indicates the spool's position when the solenoid is not energized. However, in the physical valve itself, the spring is typically located on the left side of the spool. This layout ensures that the valve returns to its default state when power is removed. Now let's look at how this valve operates. In the de-energized state, port 1, the pressure port, is connected to port 2, the rod end, while port 4, the blind end, is connected to port 5, the exhaust. This setup allows compressed air to flow into the rod end, pushing the piston back, while the air from the blind end is released through the exhaust. As a result, the cylinder retracts and stays retracted until the solenoid energizes. When the solenoid energizes, it generates a magnetic field that pulls the spool to the left and compresses the return spring. This is called a spool shift. In this position, port 2, the rod end, connects to port 3, the exhaust, and port 4, the blind end, connects to port 1, the pressure port. As a result, compressed air moves the piston forward, while the air from the rod end is released through the exhaust. To keep the cylinder extended, the solenoid must stay energized. Otherwise, the spring will return the spool to the cylinder's retracted position. If you need to keep a cylinder extended for a long time, a solenoid-operated spring return valve is not the best choice. Holding the solenoid energized for extended periods can cause it to overheat and eventually get damaged. So what valve should we use? Double-acting solenoid-operated, four-way five-port valve. It is basically the same valve we've been using. But with one key difference, there's no spring return. Instead, both sides have a solenoid. Without a spring, the spool doesn't automatically return to the de-energized position. So, if you momentarily energize solenoid A, it shifts the spool to the left, and it will stay there until solenoid B is energized. A solenoid isn't the only way to operate a valve. There are several other common methods, including levers, foot pedals, pilot-operated, and solenoid control pilot operated, often called poppet valves. Each method serves a specific purpose in the industry and is selected based on factors like the size of the valve and the requirements of the system. Now that we've covered the four-way valve, let's take a quick look at some other valves commonly used in pneumatic systems. First up is the two-way, two-position valve. These valves are typically used to turn the air supply on or off. They come in two types normally open or normally closed. This simply means the position they're in when they're not energized. Next is the three-way, two-position valve. These valves are commonly used with single-acting actuators because they can either pressurize or exhaust a single port, depending on the position. In this example, the blind end of the cylinder is exhausting through port 2, 
which is connected to port 3. When the solenoid is energized, port 2 connects to port 1, the pressure port, and the cylinder extends. Next, we have the 4-way, 3-position, 5-port open center valve. In the center position, this valve connects both the blind end and the rod end of the cylinder to the exhaust. This setup is perfect for applications where you want the rod to float or move freely if an external force is applied to it. Next, we have the 4-way, 3-position, blocked center valve. These valves are great for applications where you need to stop the actuator and hold it in a specific position. In the center position, all the ports are blocked, which means no air flows in or out of the actuator. This is especially useful for maintaining a load in place or pausing movement without any drift. It's commonly used in situations where precise control or holding force is required. Next, let's talk about the air regulator. A compressed air regulator is a device that controls the air pressure in a pneumatic system to match the system's needs. For instance, if the supply pressure is 120 PSI or 8.2 bar, but our system only requires 90 PSI or 6.2 bar, the regulator adjusts and maintains the pressure at 90 PSI. It works by reducing the higher incoming pressure to the preset level and keeping it constant, even if the supply pressure varies. Next, let's talk about the air filter. A compressed air filter removes particles like dust and dirt from the air before it enters your pneumatic system. The filter uses a mesh or porous material to catch solid particles, preventing them from causing wear and tear. Adding a filter is an easy way to extend the life of your pneumatic equipment and maintain reliable performance. The quality of compressed air can sometimes be subpar, containing water and oil. To address this issue, an air separator is installed upstream of the filter. This ensures that oil and water are removed before they reach the filter, improving overall air quality. Air separators are available with either a manual drain or an automatic drain for efficient removal of collected contaminants. Next up is the compressed air lubricator, an essential component for certain pneumatic systems. While the air separator and filter work to clean and dry the air, the lubricator serves a different purpose. It adds a fine mist of oil into the compressed airstream. This oil mist is crucial for lubricating moving parts inside pneumatic tools and actuators, reducing wear and tear and ensuring smooth operation. However, not all systems need lubrication, so make sure to check if your components require it before using a lubricator. Throughout this video, I've shown you how a two-way valve can be used as a compressed air shutoff valve. However, the most effective way to lock out a compressed air system is with a three-way shutoff valve. When in the off position, the three-way valve not only stops the incoming compressed air but also exhausts any remaining pressure from the system ensuring a safer shutdown. So what is a quick exhaust? A quick exhaust valve is a pneumatic component designed to speed up the exhaust process of air from a cylinder. It's typically used in applications where you need a fast, responsive action from a pneumatic system, like in actuators or cylinders. So let's say you have a cylinder that needs to extend quickly. Normally, when the air needs to exit the cylinder for it to extend, it has to flow all the way back through the control valve. This creates a bit of a bottleneck slowing down the process. In this example, when the cylinder is retracting, the air pressure pushes against the diaphragm or check inside the quick exhaust valve. This action seals off the exhaust port, allowing the air to flow through the normal pathway and retract the cylinder as usual. When the cylinder extends, the quick exhaust valve senses the pressure through port 2. This pressure pushes against the check or diaphragm, closing off port 1 and opening the exhaust port. This lets the air exhaust directly through the quick exhaust valve instead of traveling back through the directional valve, making the cylinder extend faster. Great job.